So welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for being here. My name is Mike Hatch, and I am a former pastor who's now working for a ministry called Truth at Work, where I'm actually um, consulting now with uh, Christian business owners and entrepreneurs. And uh, But also, I am the author of the book, Manhood Empowered by the Light of the Gospel, which just came out uh, this, this last spring. And um, Empowered Manhood, the organization that I founded that came from that book, we are partnering with John to do a trip to Israel in September 3rd through the 14th of 2024. <clears throat> and so very, very excited about that. I, as a pastor, I got to go with John to Israel twice now, um, once as just a, a visitor participant, second time as a, as a co-leader with him. And man, it is incredible. John has been on 80 some trips now, uh, should be a hundred, but we'll, we'll talk about that. Mm -hmm. But, um, but that's, that's a little bit about my background. Um, and let me go in. I just want to share a little bit of background on John as well, kind of officially, this is from his website, biblical Israel tours. So, um, John is, first of all, John is a twin. If, in case you didn't know, I didn't. I always have to remind myself of that. He's married to his amazing, wonderful, sweet, beautiful wife, Sue. He's got three children and uh, and it's two grandchildren. Is that right, John? That's right. Mm -hmm. That's right. Okay. All right. Um, he is a he is an ultra marathon runner. So we're talking 50 to 100 mile races. He he's a kayaker, um, uh, coaches. Um, uh, well, let me think here. Ba uh, no, I'm sorry, not coaches, umpires, baseball, uh, as well. And, uh, has always been athletically inclined and you see it, you see that when you're in Israel with him, by the way, and his trips tend to take on a little bit of that flavor as well. Um, taking us to places that are, that are a little bit more, um, non-touristy I would say. And, uh, but he's taken, so up to this point, it's 86 Israel tours. Uh, numerous of those were to Jordan and Egypt as well. Uh, he's taken 14 trips to Greece and Turkey to lead tours there. He has been the professor and teacher at the Solid Rock School of Discipleship College uh, from 2016 to 2019 in the International Theological, yeah, Theological College and Seminary in Nam Pen, Cambodia. He's the author of two really great books, and I've got these, and they are they're really fantastic. The Devotional Treasures from the Holy Land, where he takes some of the lessons he's teaching us today, he'll take them and use them as a devotional. And uh, and so you can walk through the Holy Land in a devotional kind of experience with, with the book. It's it's I love it. It's incredible. And then Connecting the Dots Between the Bible and the Land of Israel is his most recent book that he wrote in 2022 is when that released. Um, he's had an extensive archaeological experience going to uh, Israel and other sites seven times, actually, to participate in digs there. Um, and so that that's really cool that he brings that uh, aspect to the trips as well. So he knows about all the fun you know, places, the secrets, if you will, the, the new discoveries to take us to, because he's got all these different contacts with other, ar other uh, archaeologists out there. Um, he is a graduate of Cedarville College in Ohio with a degree in biblical studies and archaeology. He was a one-year student at the Jerusalem University College. He was a graduate of Westminster Theological Seminary in Philadelphia with a Master's of Divinity degree there is where he, he got there. Postgraduate studies uh, he did at North Park Seminary in Chicago. And then he's got a Doctor of Ministry degree from Trinity Seminary in November 2003 with a focus on Israel related ministry. So John has an extensive, extensive uh, experience and resume. And I can tell you as one who's gone on trips with him now twice and really looking forward to this third trip, um, you are in very good hands. <laughs> he is, um, you will not get the touristy uh, trap places. He'll, there are a few of those that you, you do get, you, you can't avoid those to some extent. But he's really good at getting you to the places that are much more, um, how would you describe, John, archaeologically um, accurate? Yeah. yeah, Authentic. Yes, that's yeah. that's a great way of saying. So, Dr. John Delancey, great to have you with, you with us, brother. Thank you for being with us tonight. And we're really looking forward to this, uh, this presentation. So I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to you now. And you've got sharing capabilities, right? 
I do. Let me start this off here with uh, what I hope that you can see, uh, an opening slide. So uh, this is a, an abbreviated version of what I teach typically over the course of a whole weekend. And by the way, thanks, Mike, for your kind and generous words. And uh, what this is, is uh, an hour in a little over an hour, maybe we'll try to do it with within that time period, maybe an hour and 15 minutes. We'll see. All depends on questions and other comments. But uh, so typically I, I do this in week uh, in churches uh, really around the country. It's about seven and a half hours, but I'm delighted to sort of condense this and share this with you um, as sort of a test run, if you will, for what we want as a ministry to offer to other churches. So, and John, uh, I'm sorry, real quick, I'm going to interrupt you just to, to yeah. let folks know one. I forgot to say this again. Uh, if you have any questions along the way, you can either raise your hand or feel free to put it into the chat and I can interject. There are going to be moments where I might, inter where I will be interjecting a little bit uh, along the way uh, to draw some, some application out, but just want to make you guys aware that if you have questions, feel free to put it in the chat. I'm going to be monitoring that and I'll bring those questions to John. Okay, sounds good. So what we're going to do is uh, walk through this and just to introduce to you what we are all about. Our ministry called Biblical Israel Ministries and Tours. We're a nonprofit ministry that's all about teaching the Bible in the context of the land of Israel. So you can find all kinds of resources on our website, of course, upcoming trips, and of course, the trip that Mike and I are co-leading in September next year. But uh, what we're going to do is walk through these themes or sessions, physical settings, uh, geography of the land, uh, biblical archaeology, Hebraic background of Jesus, and Jerusalem, Old and New Testament specifically. So we get a good handle on the customs and culture of the Bible, what's happening there, what sites look like, what's the land look like, and so forth. But we want to really start with this beginning theme. We need to get to know the what we call the playing board of the Bible. I have in my hand a, a topography map. You can probably see it in front of me. And uh, here it is, uh, the land of Israel, 300 miles in length and maybe 75 at its widest point here. Uh, but these topography maps, I want us to think of as a playing board, like I'm holding it now this way, and this is where Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Joshua, when he conquers the land, and here comes David and Solomon and the prophets, and here comes Jesus. Of course, uh, all of, of this biblical history happens somewhere on this map, if you will, the land of Israel, we call the playing board of the Bible. So we want to get to know the playing board, because as you remember playing for the first time, any of these games, of course, you have to know the rules, you have to know how the the pieces move, but you have to know the playing board. I contend that you can't understand the Bible in context unless you know the playing board. You can't begin understanding the narratives of the Bible until that happens. So what we're going to do is we're going to spin the world around here, about 6,000 miles or so from the East Coast, and we're going to land in the southern part of Israel, and uh, we're going to start here at the Red Sea. Here's the southern highlands, the Arava, the Negev, the Judean Desert. There's the Dead Sea, the Mediterranean Sea. There's Jerusalem. Here's the Jordan Valley. Here's where Jesus grew up right here in north side of the Jezreel Valley and, of course, the Sea of Galilee itself. Uh, so just very quickly, that's the playing board of the Bible, and we have to get to know the playing board. And certainly a part of that is to understand the physical settings of the Bible. Uh, we call it physical theology. Now, there's very important aspects of learning systematic theology or biblical theology, but we call this physical theology. We want to know the the hills, the mountains, the ridges, the, the valleys, the passes, uh, the topography of the land. And it's very, very important to understand that Israel is the land between, the land between Egypt to the south and west, there's the Nile River, and everything to the north and east, including Mesopotamia, the Mutani, the Sumerians, the Hittites, the Assyrians, the Babylonians, the Persians, you name it, 
uh, all of these people groups throughout biblical history come from the north and east. And what's in the middle of the two is the land of Israel, the most important piece of real estate uh, in the ancient world of the Bible. So here we have uh, Israel highlighted in yellow, and and uh, what's in the middle between Egypt and everything to the north is this very important land. You just don't travel through deserts. You travel up and over and through this land. Uh, they're bordering the Mediterranean Sea. So we call this the land between, and there it is primarily, uh, the land of Israel that extends 300 miles from the southern tip of the Gulf of Aqaba, all the way up to the borders with Lebanon today. This is a good example of how the surrounding countries really uh, define Israel. Here's Egypt, the Nile River, as it flows south to north, actually. Sinai Desert is all Egypt today since June of 82. Here is the land of Israel. But uh, we like to say that Israel is a very nice house in a rather challenging neighborhood because Egyptians are here, Saudi Arabia is here, Jordan is here, Syria is here, and Lebanon is due north. There's Cyprus, there's Turkey, Greece is over to the west. And what's in the middle is this land of the Bible called Israel. Israel, the land promised to Abraham. Now, look at the topography differences. Uh, we can use the Mediterranean as sea level, of course. We can just go an hour and 15 minutes to Jerusalem, which is about 3,000 feet in elevation, but then within 18 or 20 miles, drop to the lowest place on earth. It's called the Dead Sea. It's about 1,400 feet below sea level. Uh, even the Sea of Galilee, 65 miles to the north, is still 700 feet below sea level. Uh, and then just 40 miles to the north of the Sea of Galilee at 700 feet below sea level is the, the biggest mountain in the area. It's owned by three countries. Syria has the highest peak at 9,200. Israel, the second highest peak at 7,300. And Lebanon, the lower slopes on the west. So look at the topography. Quite, quite interesting. And uh, this is the land of the Bible. So we have to understand physical theology before we understand all the historical aspects, uh, the stories and narratives, and even, I will argue, even understanding the life and ministry of Jesus, uh, that's very critical to understand the, the land of the Bible first. So Israel is a very small country. In fact, the next slide before I even circle the land of Israel, you may not even see this. It's so small in comparison to some of the other uh, Arab countries uh, surrounding Israel and, of course, some of our U.S. states. But here is the land of Israel. It's about the size of New Jersey. That's it. But it was the most important piece of real estate in the Bible. So physical settings really uh, creates the context for the Bible. And, of course, uh, on a longer seminar or when we're teaching in the field in, in Israel, as we say, uh, we are indeed... Uh, talking about these kinds of disciplines that unfold before our very eyes. And all of this makes up context, and only a, a few of these we're going to highlight tonight in our uh, abbreviated condensed version of this seminar. Uh, mainly uh, topography, we're going to be talking about this, uh, geopolitical uh, situations, and that's sort of related to proximities, how close is, how close are cities to one another, how close are countries to one another? Historical geography, also a related topic. And then physical sites. We're actually going to go to uh, real biblical archaeological sites as they appear today. So uh, this will be our uh, overview of the land that consists of and, and is defined in the south by the Red Sea. And in the middle of the country on the east side, the Dead Sea. And on the west, bordering the whole country, the Mediterranean Sea, the Red, the Dead, the Med, and then the Sea of Galilee, which is a freshwater lake in the north. It's about 13 miles in length. We'll talk about that in our second session here, which is related to physical settings, but we want to sort of walk through uh, the different regions of the land of the Bible. And we're going to start here in the south. But again, first, uh, talking about the land between, 
Uh, we're talking about this whole area of what we call the Levant, the Southern Levant. There's Egypt, incidentally, and here's all these other people groups to the north and east. And look how narrow the land of Israel is. But every military campaign, every trade route came through the land of Israel, making it the most important piece of real estate, as I mentioned. But when we talk about the 15 different regions, uh, let's start with the coastal plain. And what we're going to simply do is highlight the regions on this map and uh, maybe a slide or two to illustrate uh, how unique these regions are. So nothing elaborate, but I want you to, uh, in this second piece of this presentation, I want you to sort of observe and keep in mind the uniqueness of all these regions. So for instance, the coastal plain is at sea level. In fact, this is the archeological site of Ashkelon, one of the five Philistine cities that are mentioned in the Old Testament. Here's the Mediterranean coastline, of course, and Gaza is about 20 miles to the south of Ashkelon. But the Shvela, the lowlands, is due east of the coastal plain. And uh, this is simply the hills and uh, valleys of the lowlands. On the horizon is the hill country of Judah. And this valley, I wanted to be intentional because there's five or six primary valleys. And this one is the Ela Valley. In fact, we know that when we wind to this narrow part of the valley, right in between this hill and this hill, we think that maybe this is where the Philistines were occupying one hill and the Israelites another with a narrow valley in between. This very well could be the place where David and Goliath fought together. Or it could be this narrow section of valley here a little further east. So uh, this is the topography of the lowlands. It's small hills and valleys. And John, I'm sorry, real quick, can you just go back a uh, slide or two? Just wanted to mention something that's, that's, yeah, that's good right there. What's really interesting about this is when you actually go and visit, I remember I went with him before to, and we stood it, over here very close to where this picture maybe is taken from. And you can just imagine as you're standing there, you can see how close the hills are together and how you could you could imagine Israel's army on the one side or, or, or the Philistines on the other and how it wouldn't be terribly difficult to communicate in terms of sending sounds across the valley. And, uh, and you can just imagine how it would set up a great theater for this battle between, uh, between David and, and uh, Goliath. That's right. And Goliath was as tall as an Iron Age gate was wide. It's an interesting new study research. I just read a paper about six months ago on this, that um, the exact almost to the centimeter as tall as the Bible says that Goliath was, is the typical width of a gate. So in other words, Goliath was a tall dude as wide as a gate. And that battle took place right there. Thanks, Mike. Uh, here's the Negev is the third area or region. It's to the south. In fact, it extends further south. So notice the topography is much different. Now, most people think that Israel is one big desert. And that's certainly the case uh, in the south and along the Dead Sea. But uh, you're going to see as we head north, that's not the case. But uh, this is the uh, the Negev. The Judean desert, again, is desert, as we would uh, expect it to be. And the Jor Jordan River Valley uh, extends 65 miles. I guess I didn't have a slide here of the Judean desert, but... Uh, it's sort of looking like this anyway. They're very similar, uh, this area of uh, the southern Negev and the Judean Desert. But the Jordan River Valley is indeed, oh, there it is. I do have a slide. I just misplaced it. Uh, this is the Jordan, excuse me, the, the Judean Desert and uh, the Dead Sea here uh, to the east. So uh, the desert only gets a couple rain events a year. And uh, here's another part of the desert uh, just to the east of Jerusalem. It's called the Wadi Kelt. And and John, real quick, just wanted to make this uh, observation too with regard to those pictures. It, it looks like sand. It looks like you're looking at a Saharan desert, 
But believe it or not, that's all rocks. It's very, very rocky. It just, it's, it's incredible terrain. Um, it's just interesting when you look at it. Yeah. Like it looks like what you'd see, you know, in a, in a movie with someone traipsing along the desert sand, that is not sand. That is, that's rocky is what that is. Yep. It's Eocene limestone, a very chalky limestone. And, uh, in fact, we just hiked down there uh, a couple of weeks ago with, uh, with my last group. The hill country of Judah is 3,000 feet in elevation, so it rises about 4,500 feet from the Dead Sea. And Jerusalem, as we'll get to at the very end of our presentation of the old city of Jerusalem, we'll talk more specifically about the details. Just to the north of Jerusalem, which is here, is the hill country of Samaria. And this is, again, uplift of uh, limestone uh, mountains about 3,000 feet in elevation, 2,800 feet with uh, very nice, gentle valleys in between. Going back to the Mediterranean coastline, whereas we call, the, call, uh, call this the coastal plain or the Philistine plain, we call this now the Sharon plain. And the primary archaeological site here is the city of Caesarea. We'll talk about this again in our archaeological session coming up soon. But uh, again, at sea level and uh, a few archaeological sites that we'll mention later. The Carmel Range is about 13 miles long and about 1,500 feet in elevation. It rises up between uh, the coastal plain and between the Jezreel Valley that we see here extending to the east and north. The Carmel Range is uh, looks like the hills around Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, where Mike and I are from, but it's the, the forest area of Israel today. But just on the other side of the Carmel Range is the Jezreel Valley. And we could spend just uh, all night long, literally, on this one slide, because here's a city called Megiddo. Here's the Hill of Moray, the Mount of Tabor, it's called, and the Nazareth Ridge. Jesus grew up here. I'd like to say that this whole valley is the backyard of Jesus, uh, where he grew up. But look how important the Jezreel Valley actually was. We're not surprised at all to see archaeological sites like Yokneum and Megiddo and Tanakh and uh, Beit Shan and even Nazareth, as I mentioned before, uh, right here on the north side of the Jezreel Valley. It was the most important valley in ancient days, and it's Israel's breadbasket today. In fact, there's an Egyptian pharaoh named Thutmose III, who in 1468 BC, there's a statue of him and uh, this is what he looks like today. But he actually took Megiddo. He wrote about it on the walls of Karnak, a temple in Luxor in southern Egypt today. And he talked about capturing Megiddo was like capturing a thousand cities. And he came up this one pass and Megiddo guarded it and he took the city. So he knew the importance of that particular city. But look how lush and green it is. This is the hill of Moray, incidentally. Uh, the city of Nain, mentioned in Luke 7, is there. On the other side is the city of Shunem, mentioned in 2 Kings 4. But the lower galley extends to the north of the Jezreel Valley. And uh, it also has uh, high hills. In fact, right here, if you're seeing where I'm pointing, is the area of Cana, where the first miracle took place, John 2. But uh, this is the Beit Natofa Valley. So very characteristic of the lower Galilee, uh, in contrast to the Sea of Galilee Basin. So here we uh, descend back under sea level, and uh, two images of the length of the lake, 13 miles in length, and seven and a half, or six and a half or seven at its widest point. This is a freshwater lake, whereas the Dead Sea is about 900 feet deep. This is only about 120 feet deep. But... Uh, on all of our trips, one way or another, whether you hike it up the cliff or take the gentle pathway, uh, this is the great view of the whole northwest corner of the lake from uh, the Arbel Cliff, it's called. Right there is Capernaum. We'll return here when we talk about Jesus in a moment. But this is on the northwest corner of the lake. And then finishing up with these other regions, uh, the Upper Galilee which is, again, high mountains like Mount Merom and uh, about 3,000 feet in elevation, but it overlooks the border with, with Lebanon. So does the Hola Valley, just to the east. In fact, there's Mount Hermon, which uh, this part is Lebanon. The higher part are 
Israel, and then there's a higher peak behind it. Uh, that's Syria. This is the Hola Valley. This is the Golan Heights. We're taking this from the hills of Naphtali. So this city here is Matula. It's in Israel today. And across this valley is Lebanon. That's how close we are to the border. And then the Golan Heights is a, an area of land about 38 miles from the south uh, corner of the Sea of Galilee. There you see it. Uh, to Mount Hermon. So all of this to the east is Syria. The Golan Heights is primarily a plateau with, with uh, volcanoes. And uh, Mount Hermon is shared, as I mentioned, by three countries. It's snow-capped about five months a year. So there's even a ski resort. In fact, a couple of weeks ago, we hiked down, we took a, the chairlift up and then hiked down the, the trail uh, here at Mount Hermon. So that's uh, the geography of the land in a very brief uh, way, a nutshell, if you will, of what we could expand uh, further. So um, biblical archaeology is another aspect of learning Bible in context. So what we're going to do is briefly just share a few things that relate to the Bible as we use archaeology not to prove the Bible, but to confirm its historicity. But let's start with uh, something fun, what archaeology is not. It is not, my friends, Indiana Jones style of archaeology. It's not hunting for famous things, although important artifacts are indeed found. It's not hunting for the Ark of the Covenant. We could do a whole evening on the question, where is the Ark of the Covenant now? Uh, but we will not uh, digress from uh, our, our focus tonight. But uh, archaeology is not glamorous. It's hard work. And it's basically digging through layers and layers or stratification of layers and levels of occupation, like we see here on the model of Megiddo. You can notice that there's some ruins that have been exposed down here and also here and also underneath this piece that pops up with a uh, push of a button. The white represent Iron Age or the time of Solomon and the lower levels uh, are ruins from a thousand years prior to Abraham. This particular site of Megiddo has 25 layers of occupation one layer upon another upon another that span about 2,500 years. Don't ever think that our country is old at all. Uh, something 250 years old, we don't even blink an eye at it in Israel. Think of these layers of stratification, we call it stratigraphy, as layers of occupation. And of course, the lower you go, uh, the earlier the ruins may be. So when we talk about pieces of cake, for instance, I like this one on the right in particular. My daughter made that when they were living in Washington State. Archaeology is basically unfolding or uncovering one layer upon another. Although all these archaeological layers don't look so pristine and precise as this piece of chocolate cake. Disregard the ice cream, by the way. But uh, it's sort of looking like this blackberry cake that my daughter made. All the levels sort of blend in together like a piece of lasagna, if you will. So when we dig, we dig down through the upper layers and we expose all the other bottom layers. Uh, over time, all of these layers, because of the site being unoccupied or abandoned or destroyed, have been covered up with dust and debris. And now we as archaeologists, we dig down through these sites. So uh, I want to take you to a couple select archaeological sites in Israel and uh, talk about how the archaeology works, like at, Megi uh, at Beersheba. It's located in the Negev, and you can see that this city is very small. In fact, the ruins primarily date from the time of Solomon and onward uh, to its destruction in 586 BC. But notice that it's located in the Negev, which is a, a fairly flat area. Uh, here in the northern Negev. However, in the northeast corner is another archaeological site called Arad. Down below are ruins from the early Bronze period. That's the same as early Canaanite. I'm using them, them interchangeably. 
But on the top here, we call it the citadel. This is all Judean ruins. In fact, right here is a good example of one of these false worship centers. Apparently, the Judeans uh, did not want to go to Jerusalem, 75 miles to the north. So they built their own temple here. They had sacrifices. In fact, there is the sacrificial altar. There's the high place in the Holy of Holies. They probably even combined uh, the uh, worship of Yahweh with Baal or the Asherah, the female goddess of fertility, and Baal, the storm and rain god of the Phoenicians and the Canaanites. So not only were they worshiping at this high place uh, in a non-kosher way, they were even perhaps even blending and distorting the true worship of God. Now, John, real quick, I wanted to interrupt there for a second. If you would go back, this is this was one of the more, I would say for me, uh, impactful sites that that we went to. And if you would, could you just, because you mentioned that this is a high place. And so a high place I had always envisioned in the Bible as being a place where there were, there was uh, pagan statues of other gods and stuff that are set up or some kind of altars that were set up for pagan sacrifice. But here you actually see an example of what you just said is, is a replica of the temple in Jerusalem. So a high place could have been that. It could have been something where it seems as though someone, like, like the town would have had good intentions maybe to have created a replica just so they wouldn't have to travel so far. Um, so that would be considered a high place as well, right? That's right. Yeah, high places were cultic centers for religious activity and most of the time if not the majority of the time they were uh, against mosaic law god demanded centralized worship in jerusalem and this is an example of where uh, that was not observed yeah and also an example of when you don't obey god's law to gather together like he has required us to it's very easy then, because I, I I equate this, I apply this to our to church today. If we're not, if we're not, uh, you know, regularly meeting in church with the rest of the body, and we're we've isolated ourselves, or it's very easy to get absorbed into cultural paganism in in its various forms. Which clearly, this is a great example of how that happened to them. So in the Shvela is a city called Lakish. You can see it's about 30, 35 acres in size exposed towers and walls in fact uh this is an outer wall this is an inner wall this is an outer gate an inner gate and the palace most likely built by rehoboam how do we know this it's because second chronicles 11 tells us here's the line of another wall probably a 10th century wall and uh, the city was a double walled city fortified well and destroyed by the assyrians and then for good later on by the babylonians in 587 bc in fact, the Assyrians even uh, proudly displayed uh, on the relief of uh, palace in Nineveh how they conquered it. There's a big battering ram coming up a siege ramp that was built. The poor Judean uh, or the Judeans are protecting the tower with little bows and arrows. Women and children are being deported from the gate. Uh, this is a depiction or a relief, as we call it, of uh, the siege of Lachish. And a good example of how we, again, can use archaeology and even open our Bibles to Isaiah 36 and 37 and see what the Bible states as historical fact. Archaeology confirms that. The most important archaeological site, hands down, not by size or the types of ruins, but what was found at Qumran, the Dead Sea Scrolls, the most important and significant site there is. So 1947, although this picture is from 1952, here in Cave 1, in fact, there it is right there. And this is our Cave 1. I think, Mike, you've been in it with me, I think, before. Uh, the story of the Dead Sea Scrolls begins. Uh, in jars pictured here, they found uh, examples of biblical texts that predated, predated the earliest Hebrew texts that we had before. Um, these date from the 3rd century B.C. to the 1st century A.D. Uh, the previously oldest text of Hebrew scriptures was about 1,000 A.D. So about 63% of them have been found in Cave 4, one of 12 caves now. Uh, 
And I'll just give you an example of how precise some of these scrolls look like, like the Ten Commandments. And the, the Pesher or the commentary on Habakkuk. Look how precise that Hebrew is. Uh, an Israeli kid, 10 years old, could read this like he's reading the newspaper. The longest scroll found in Cave 11 in 1956, uh, it's about 25 and a half feet long, called the Temple Scroll. Here's an interesting scroll called the Messiah Scroll. So the Essenes were the ones who scribed these scrolls, and they believed that the Messiah would come from not only the branch of David, but also from Aaron's priestly line. It sure sounds like they were familiar with this guy named Jesus, who we know, of course, as the Jewish Messiah of the first century. They even found uh, five or six extra Psalms. We all know there's only 150 in our Bible, but this particular one mentions it's written by David, and it mentions humbly how God called him uh, from being a shepherd boy. Uh, and then the Isaiah scroll, the second longest one, and this very uh amazing text uh, the isaiah scroll there's actually two scrolls of isaiah found and uh I, and uh, this particular scroll is i think the, the most impressive of them all not only because of its length but because of its accuracy so uh, the dead sea scrolls provide us an early form of the hebrew bible so compare Lachish, 35 acres, or Hatzor, 200 acres, or Gath, 130 acres, with a small site like this. You know it as Jericho. It's only 9 or 11 acres, depending on how you count it. But these two walls down here, one and two, uh, were most likely the walls that Joshua saw. In fact, when he crossed the Jordan River with his men, remember Mount Nebo is up here. Moses dies on Mount Nebo. And then Joshua crosses the Jordan River. And then the first of 31 cities that he would take would be a, most likely a double-walled city. It had a stone retaining wall, and then on top of the stone wall was a mud brick wall. So the stone walls have been found intact, and also numerous examples of the mud brick wall that was on top of the stone wall, similar to this image on the right. So when these Israelites circled the city seven times, probably taking 15 minutes maybe at, uh, for a circle, so what's that, an hour and a half or so, they circled the city, they blew their ram's horns, and it's most likely the mud brick wall that came tumbling down and outward, providing a nice convenient bridge perhaps for the Israelites to take the city. Again, archaeology confirms the historicity of the Bible. So does this city called Gezer. It's about 35 acres. I excavated here in 2017. In fact, I excavated right in this area here in uh, what we call the Middle Bronze or Canaanite period. It's uh, an area between 1700 and 1600 BC. Look at how large this Canaanite tower was. But the girl, the 22-year-old girl right next to me, found this. It's in a bowl, and uh, this is what these items look like. You couldn't tell what they were until they were cleaned up in the off-season. And uh, here they found a golden scarab and a silver pendant. Quite, quite remarkable. You never know what you're going to find. This dates 3,600 years old. In contrast to this gate, three chambers on one side, three in the other this gate was built by Solomon here at Gezer. How do we know that? Well, 1 Kings chapter 9 uh, suggests this. Let's go to the coastal uh, plain again, or the Sharon plain here in the north, and we can see uh, Caesarea. In fact, the city in the days of Peter and Paul, who were here, uh, looked like this. It had a theater. It had a praetorium. <laughs> in fact, Paul was uh, under siege here. He was imprisoned for two years here, according to Acts 24, 25, and 26. Here's the Hippodrome where chariots and horses were raced and the Grand Harbor. Paul sails in and out of this harbor uh, for his mission journeys and then sails out of it one last time on his way to Rome after he spent oh, two full years here. 
So we can read Acts 8, 9, 10, 12, 21, 26, all that uh, biblical stories that took place here. In 1962, they did find a very important inscription uh, in secondary use, which means this stone was being used in the theater later on in the late Roman period. But look at the names that appear. Tiberium, who was the emperor in the days of Jesus, and this name, P-I-L-A-T-U-S, Pilatus, Pilate. We know him as Pontius Pilate, the one who condemned Jesus to crucifixion. This was found in 1962. We call this a primary source. And then just to the north of Jerusalem, about 20 miles, is Shiloh or Shiloh. Uh, we plan to dig here next June, incidentally. And right where I'm pointing at is probably where the tabernacle was located for over 300 years. It probably looks similar to this, according to Dr. Leon Rittmeyer, the expert on the tabernacle and temple. Remember, 1 Samuel 3 is where uh, we read about Samuel's calling, and he responds with a very significant Hebrew word, Hineni, here I am. Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So, so far, the uh, excavators, Dr. Scott Stripling, have discovered a middle bronze wall and other storage rooms, and including uh, things like the horns of the altar, the sacrificial altar. I think three of these have been found so far. He even thinks that he found the Holy of Holies, but uh, that has not been confirmed yet. But look at Megiddo, this old Canaanite city with about 25 layers. There's the water system. There's a, a grain silo, gates over here. In fact, this is a gate that probably Joshua saw. This is a gate here, what's left of it, uh, that Solomon built. His palace was up a little further higher on the site, but uh, the city of Megiddo in the days of Solomon probably looked like this. So we can reconstruct biblical sites and determine how people lived in the days of the Bible. Now, compare how well excavated this site is, Megiddo, with this site. And I'm taking you to a site that uh, I have only taken a group here once. I've only been here twice. It requires off the beaten track and a hike about 30 minutes to the top. But it's biblical Cana, John 2. In fact, this square re rectangular form is probably the synagogue. And Jesus, of course, perform a miracle here. We know Cana is mentioned in John 2 and John 4. Now compare that site that's only been excavated uh, in a limited way compared to that with this huge site called Beit Shan, a big Roman city, one of the Decapolis cities. It had a great theater that held about 7,500 people, had colonnaded streets, had an agora, it had even a public latrine right uh, here and bathhouses here. An incredible excavation of the 80s and 90s. But way on the northern border, uh, this uh, foundation seems to be the foundation for an altar, a sacrificial altar. So when we read our Bibles in 1 Kings 12, we read about Jeroboam establishing a, a, a sacrificial high place here. In fact, on I guess I don't have a picture of the steps of the high place, but just to, uh, no, actually it's right uh, in this direction to the right. Uh, that's where the steps of the high place would be where a golden calf was placed. But also at the gate area here at Dan, there's the city wall incidentally and the outer gate of the city. In 1993, July, that year, they found one of the most important inscriptions ever found. It says in a Paleo-Hebrew text, the house of David. There it is, D-V-D. It's the only extra-biblical reference to David or David outside the Bible. So here's a primary source, again, confirming the historicity of the Bible. So we can agree with Dr. Clifford Wilson, who says, I know of no finding in archaeology that's properly confirmed, which is in opposition to the scriptures. The Bible is the most accurate history textbook the world has ever seen. And amen to that. So uh, I guess I'll continue on again. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, let Mike know or chat them or raise your hand. And certainly we invite Mike to 
interject at any time as well. So uh, let's move on to the Hebraic background of Jesus. And again, we could spend all night and all day tomorrow <laughs> talking about Jesus, but what we want to sort of do is understand the context of where he lived, who he was, what Jesus did, where he taught, how he taught, what he taught, and even why he taught. This will indeed give us a, a deeper understanding of Jesus. So on tour, of course, uh, we highlight this in more detail, but I think Dr. Tom Triblehorn, someone who I studied with in Israel back in the 80s, uh, hit it right on the mark. He says, how has the most, most of the Western Christian world missed the importance of the study of the Hebraic background of the scriptures? The Jewish roots of the Christian faith have not simply been left unexplored, but they have too often been purposely and willfully ignored. And that should uh, trouble us a little. I think part of what he mentions here at the end of his quote is, I think, due to the rise of anti-Semitism uh, within even the evangelical church, which, again, is uh, is worrisome to me. But certainly we want to get back to the Hebraic background of Jesus and talk about where he served. In fact, he grew up in Nazareth, as we know, uh, when he was about 10 years old. We know this from the historical records. In 6 AD, uh, a guy named Judas the Galilean, someone who incidentally is mentioned in Acts chapter 5, uh, Judas uh, the Galilean led a revolt against the Romans. Indeed, Jesus was very familiar with this revolt. In fact, Judas the Galilean was one of these first century messianic figures. Jesus, of course, was also a messianic figure, but he came uh, for a spiritual purpose. So where Jesus primarily served was around the Sea of Galilee. In fact, this is the plain of Gennesaret. Right behind the, the cliff is Magdala, where Mary was from. Uh, this is Capernaum, Bethsaida, Chorazin. Uh, this is really the backyard of uh, Jesus' ministry here in the Sea of Galilee area. Capernaum was a small town, I would say 1,200, 1,500 people. Uh, the synagogue was there. We read about this in Mark 1. In fact, we could um, just uh, shoot off the hip here and talk about Mark 1, Mark 2, Mark 9, Luke 7, John 6. All these passages are good examples of how Jesus um, served the people here. In fact, Capernaum was one of about 15 or 16 ports around the lake. So the white structure that you see here is a late 4th or early 5th century synagogue, but underneath it, as well as all the basaltic stone ruins, are from the 1st century. Underneath this building, which is actually a Catholic church on stilts, is suggested to be the house of Peter. There is Capernaum on this northwest corner, and we know that, again, the length of the lake, 13 miles, but all around, especially in the west side, was uh, many Jewish towns and villages, not necessarily on the east side because this was dominated by Gentiles. But uh, we can understand how Jesus came to teach, to heal, and even to sail on the Sea of Galilee and perform a miracle. This boat was found in 1986, restored. Now it looks like this. Now, my friends, uh, can you picture... Uh, a dozen disciples and Jesus in a small fishing boat like this that dates to the first century. In Mark 4, we read the story when the disciples encounter the wind and the waves. They wake up Jesus and say, Master, don't you care if we drown? And of course, Jesus gets up and says, Peace be still, and the waves are calmed. So Jesus came to be a Messiah like figure, one of six or seven others throughout the course of the first century. Jesus was unique, as we know, because he was born of a virgin, Isaiah chapter 7, and he came with a spiritual purpose. In fact, Isaiah 7 talks about the virgin birth. This is what that verse looks like on uh, the Isaiah scroll of the Dead Sea text. Jesus came to call disciples. Now, the, the name or the title for disciples is different. Back in the first century, they're called Talmudim. A Talmudim was someone who wanted to cover yourself with the dust of their feet, 
the sages, the rabbi, and you wanted to drink in their words thirstedly. These are uh, this is a quote from Yose ben Ozer from the second century BC. But uh, when Jesus called twelve disciples, he was doing what every rabbi would do. You would call a group of followers, and then as a follower or as a Talmud or Talmudim, that's the plural, you would you would literally want to uh, drink in every word. You wanted to not miss any of his teaching. So this is what Jesus did. He gathered uh, followers, and he wore a tallit and telephim. In fact, today, the Orthodox Jew wear these tallits. They're called prayer shawls, and they also wear these telephim. They're called phylacteries in Matthew chapter 23. Uh, notice that on the box here that contains the scriptures of Deuteronomy 6 is what looks like to us as a W, but it, that is the letter Shin in Hebrew, and it's the first word of Deuteronomy 6 verse 4, Shema Israel Adonai. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, Achad, he is one. So think of the the hem of the garment, the story of Luke 8, for instance, the woman with an issue of bleeding. She was most likely trying to touch the hem of the garment because in Hebrew, the word for hem is kanaf or kanafim plural. And the word in Malachi chapter four for wings is the same word, kanafim. And it talks about healing in the kanafim. So could it be that this woman wanted to simply touch the the tassels or the hem of Jesus' garment, thinking that in doing so, she would be healed. But in a very tender way, Jesus says, daughter, your faith has healed you. It's incidentally the only time that Jesus refers to a woman as daughter. Very tender moment there in Luke 8. But primarily where Jesus taught was in synagogues. Now, prior to the destruction of the temple in 70 AD, synagogues were not at all worship and sacrificial areas. This was teaching areas where the scrolls of the Torah were read and then a commentary on the prophets. Can you can you picture uh, people gathered in this synagogue at Magdala, even including Mary Magdalene and Jesus placing the scroll here after he read it from Isaiah 61, for instance, uh, that's what happened in Nazareth. But uh, maybe 50, 60, 65, 70 maybe people could be hearing him at once and everyone saw each other. Think of a synagogue like this, where Jesus, a rabbi, would be given the scroll and he would be commenting on it. There's actually another uh, first century synagogue. Only seven or eight have been found in Israel, but one at, at Gamla. This is a reconstruction of Gamla a Jewish site in the Golan Heights. But here it is, a little longer, a little wider. So my guess is maybe 100 people could have fit here. But when we read about uh, Jesus in Matthew 4, Matthew 9, we read about how Jesus uh, taught in the synagogues at Gamla. In fact, there's Mike. Thanks for waving there, Mike. You're looking good, man. That's right. Yeah, this was an incredible site, John, because this was, it's hard to tell with the pictures you've got here, but it it's it's a it's a large, I don't know if you call it a hill or a mountain, but it kind of sits on top of that, almost mm -hmm. like it's balanced up there. It's really incredible. And so where we're sitting there, or where you're seeing people sit there, over the edge there is is a steep decline. And then over the if you to the right of the picture, there's another steep decline there as well. Um, it's it's a phenomenal uh place to be and to see where they built such a thing like this. And can you picture Jesus uh teaching? Maybe yeah. reading from here, this is called the platform of stone. And then he set down the scroll and probably sat back here with every eye on him of those sitting in the synagogue. This is a good example of how we can picture. Oh, there's the arrow. Mike, you get even a, a red arrow here. Tonight, so <laughs> nice. That's yes. pretty cool. So guiding Jewish principles and practices that Jesus integrated was that he primarily used Hebrew and Aramaic. But he also used mashal. We know them as parables. We have 30 of them in the Gospels. But every other rabbi used parables as well. And then uh, Jesus also used what is called remez. Remez is a word that means hint. When I say Mary had a little lamb, 
that's all I have to say, because I'm assuming that uh, that one short phrase, you're you're aware of what comes next, right? And the fleece was white as snow. Or, oh, say, can you see? Uh, I don't have to sing the whole national anthem. I'm assuming that you know it. Uh, we use remez all the time. Well, guess how many times Jesus used remez as recorded in the four Gospels? Over 200 times. So my contention is how can we understand what Jesus was teaching if we don't understand how he taught? This is what it means when we say we have to understand the Hebraic background of his teaching. I'm going to give you a couple examples here. And uh, the first one is taken from Matthew 11. We know this uh, very common uh, passage. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am gentle and lowly of heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Well, that one phrase, rest for your souls, actually Jesus borrowed. It comes from Jeremiah 6.16, stand in the ways and see and ask for the old paths where the good way is and walk in it, and then you will find rest for your souls. One other thing I need to say is what's this? issue about yoke. In this case, it's not about a yoke around an animal's neck to control it, because every rabbi had what is called the yoke of the Torah. He had his own uh, way of interpreting the law. So Jesus, by implication here in Matthew 29, 11, 29, is saying this, only by following in the right paths of my interpretation of the law, says Jesus, can you find rest for your souls. So understanding this as a remez, I think, broadens our understanding of what Jesus is trying to say. Now, here's one that's interesting that you may not agree with, but uh, I believe that Jesus used remez on the cross of Calvary when at three in the afternoon, he cries out something in Aramaic, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It comes from the first verse of chapter 22 of Psalms. But you have to understand that Psalm 22, 23, and 24 were a group of shepherding psalms. So could it be that Jesus, by saying the first verse or phrase from verse 1, was really implying what comes at the end of chapter 24? Lift up your heads, you gates, that the King of glory may come in. Could it be that this is the implication. Even on the cross, Jesus was telling them that he was, in fact, the king of glory. I'm going to contend that Jesus was not feeling forsaken by his heavenly father at all. After all, how could we even conclude that? Because the night before, Jesus said in the Garden of Gethsemane, not my will, but yours be done. He, in fact, was stating that he was the king. In fact, after he said this, what did they do? They put a sign in three languages above him saying king of the Jews. So Jesus was claiming his kingship and he wanted everyone to know. And he indeed was the king who offered himself for the sins of the world. Jesus also had a solid view of the Torah. The Torah technically means teaching or instruction. In fact, Jesus says in the Sermon of the Mount, don't think I've come to abolish the law, but I've come to fulfill them. The word fulfill in Hebrew means to place on a firmer foundation. So Jesus came to fulfill redemptive history, not to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. He came for a purpose, a redemptive purpose. In fact, when John the Baptist would echo the same words from Isaiah, the same words that Isaiah would say in 700 BC, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight a highway for our God. This is exactly what <clears throat> John the Baptist would echo in preparation for Jesus coming. And indeed, Jesus came for a primary purpose, to bring near the reign and rule of God's kingdom. In fact, this is what we read about in Mark chapter 1. The time has come, the kingdom of God has come near, repent and believe the good news. So when he's speaking here, maybe on this hill or on the slopes of Arbel, we're not sure where the Sermon of the Mountain took place, uh, he taught about the kingdom. But Luke 6 records that he taught about it, the kingdom in the plain, maybe the plains of Gennesaret. Is there a contradiction in the Gospels? Of course not. Uh, this is simply 
or was simply his go-to message uh, here uh, in the Galilee and elsewhere. So when he is handed the scroll in the synagogue at Nazareth, which has not been found, by the way, uh, he read this portion. We know it as chapter 61, verses 1 and 2. And in doing so, in fact, this could be a, a whole evening topic as well, but uh, Jesus unfolded his purpose, his spiritual purpose of proclaiming good news to the poor, to proclaim freedom for the prisoners, to give sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, a phrase that he borrowed from chapter 58, verse 6 of Isaiah, and then to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. So Jesus came for a five-fold purpose, and he, of course, accomplished that uh, on the cross of Calvary. Now, John, I'm going to stop you for a second, because I wanted to point something out and ask for you to share the the resources because we had said it in the last webinar i mentioned just the as a pastor how convicting not being trained properly in in remez as you talked about um where jesus hints at different other pieces of scripture i think unfortunately my personal take on it is that um and not, no i have no uh, i'm not attacking them i'm a i'm a product of the evangelical movement if you will um, but one of the things we lost in some ways through the evangelical movement is that idea of remez and understanding the context. So I remember growing up hearing that, you know, when Christ was on the cross, he was forsaken, that God the Father turned his back on him because he was so full of sin, you know, and it was it was very compelling for me to hear that. And um, understanding a little different um, take on it, like you just shared, is very helpful. But it's also, again, like I said, convicting as a pastor that there's so much of that that we miss. In, in the Bible. And it makes me wonder how much else, how much more have I missed, you know, that, that were hints like that. But you mentioned two resources and I, I missed the one. The one is a book called Our Father Abraham, you mentioned, which is one that can be very helpful. You mentioned another one though. What was the other one? Well, Our Father Abraham is written by Marvin Wilson. Good mm -hmm. book, good starter book. It's pretty deep. But the other book uh, is uh, Jesus, the Jewish Theologian. It's by Brad Young, Dr. Brad Young. Yes. Okay. So good good starting point books to understand the Hebraic background of Jesus. Great. So let's, Thank you uh, for that. let's finish up with Jerusalem if I can. And uh, I don't think Jerusalem looked like this in the days of Jesus, but a good picture. What do you think? We'll talk about the Temple Mount in just a moment, but let's talk about the old city walls. I'm retracing them with my red arrow. It's a 2.8 mile wall built in 1537 AD by Suleiman, the Ottoman emperor. And uh, these walls are not very old. It took them about seven years to build, completed in 1544. Uh, but it's 2.8 miles. So there's uh, four quarters of the old city, the Armenian, the Jewish quarter, the Christian quarter, and the Muslim quarter. Today, uh, 35,000 people live within the old city walls of Jerusalem. In fact, prior to uh, about 1860 A.D., every Jerusalemite resident lived within the walls until uh, the first Jewish community uh, made their way out of the old city. And uh, uh, that was the beginning of the expansion of the city of Jerusalem. But when we go back to the Old Testament days, to when Abraham is here, Genesis 14, Genesis 22, um, it was called Salem. It probably wasn't even walled at that point. It probably didn't become fortified until the Jebusite period of the 16th century BC. Abraham's about 20th century BC. Notice that this hill to the north is vacant. This is what we call Mount Moriah or Mount Moriah. Genesis 22 is where we read about Abraham taking his Isaac, uh, his son Isaac, and God providing a sacrifice for him. That happened somewhere here on the northern hill. But when Solomon would actually expand the city from uh, his father's day, David, and he had a palace here, he built the temple on Mount Moriah. In fact, on the same location, according to Second Chronicles 3, where uh, God provided a sacrifice a thousand years prior to Solomon. I think that's quite, quite significant. This has always been a place where God has provided a sacrifice. Now, Solomon's temple looked like this. It had a big uh, sacrificial altar, a, a laver, and the chamber of the temple. 
quite large in size, larger than the tabernacle, most likely. And inside the tabernacle or the temple was the menorah or the lampstand, uh, the table of presence or the showbread table, and the incense altar. And then once a year, the Holy of Holies would be visited by the high priest. And this is where the Ark of the Covenant was. Now, underneath today's Dome of the Rock that was built and completed not until 692 A.D., is a stone, a big rock, and maybe on this indentation there is where the Ark of the Covenant was placed. We know that Mace, uh, probably Josiah, in the end of the 7th century, before his death, trying to stop Pharaoh Necho, we read this in Second Chronicles 34, coming up from the south, uh, we think that Josiah hid the Ark of the Covenant somewhere. So today, where the first and second temple were located is now this Dome of the Rock on the Temple Mount that's big enough now for about a dozen football fields. It's about 36 acres in size. Uh, why? Because Herod the Great actually expanded the temple. We'll talk about that in a moment. But underneath the dome is the rock that I just showed you. So now, his... John, real quick, I, I want to, I'm sorry, I want to interrupt for just a second because I had a question a mm -hmm. few slides back when you, when you showed the topography of, of the, of Jerusalem and, and the city of David. Yeah. There right there. Yeah. So it, it strikes me how similar that looks of, of course, in a bigger way to the site of Shiloh. So in, in Shiloh, it, you know, that the center is, is a bit of a, a propped up hill and then you've got mountains and hills that surround it. Mm -hmm. Um, do you think there is any intentionality about picking that spot as being similar looking to what where Jerusalem would end up residing permanently? That could be because Shiloh is not, the tabernacle was not built on the highest hill. There's hills all around it. Right. It's, that's because uh, when the tribes were supposed to meet at the tabernacle three times a year, three on each side of the tabernacle, they all had to look down upon it. Well, the same goes for uh, the Temple Mount today. Uh, the mm -hmm. Temple Mount is not the highest of the hills. In fact, this hill is higher and the Mount of Olives is higher. Hence the term or the phrase in Psalm 125 uh, as the mountains surround Jerusalem. So uh, apparently the, the temple, just like the tabernacle at Shiloh, was simply built uh, with higher hills around it. It's a good observation, I think. And uh, but, and real quick too, we've got Patrick Donahoe has a question that uh, that he brought up in the chat about the Dome of the Rock. He says, um, "Is it true that the belief of Muhammad ascended into heaven is fairly recent, like last century?" No, that's uh, an old tradition that's from the eighth century, seventh century A.D. Uh, although the Quran mentions that his supposed night time vision ride on his white horse happened only a two-day ride from Mecca. So we know that, uh, well, number one, it didn't happen, but uh, according to the Quran, <laughs> it, it happened in Saudi Arabia today and not Jerusalem. So that tradition goes back mm. about uh, 1,300 years, if not okay. a little longer than that. But it's a good observation. But uh, So the Muslims think that the Dome of the Rock is the third most holy place for Arabs or Muslims today, I should say, hmm. uh, but that's based on, uh, let's just say, incorrect uh, history, but uh, we can get into that topic on another evening. Let's move on to Hezekiah, because Hezekiah, of course, was the king at the end of the 8th century, and the Assyrian army was surrounding it, uh, the city that is. So what did he do? According to Second Kings chapter 20, Second Chronicles 32 and Isaiah chapter 8, verse 6, he built a tunnel from the Gihon Spring, and it's 1,700 feet long, and he deposited water into a reservoir. In fact, he says, why should the enemy have all this water? So he reinforced and protected the spring of the city, and he filtered the city through this tunnel. Now, what's so cool today is that we still walk through this tunnel. In fact, we can see where they chiseled uh, an incorrect direction, and then decided to backtrack and go this way. Uh, but two teams of rock cutters, actually, as we'll talk about the inscription, were uh, used to build this tunnel. Now, let's just walk through it briefly, because uh, we're walking through water. You can see the chisel marks. They're all going the same direction. 
So the team of rock cutters that started at the spring met the team that started at the southern end until they met together. In fact, uh, just a couple minutes after where you're seeing now is where uh, the meeting point was, was. So this is an amazing thing to experience with a flashlight and with water shoes um, in hand. So the inscription was found in about, uh, about 1880s. Uh, and uh, about 25 feet from the very end, written on six lines in a Paleo Hebrew, an earlier form of Hebrew, and it tells us how the tunnel was made. Talking about inscriptions, uh, this one is one that mentions Hezekiah, the son of Ahaz. That's quite amazing. Hezekiah. And this one, Isaiah, the prophet. I think there's a letter here that's missing that would maybe confirm that the word prophet is uh, intact. So inscriptions from 2,700 years ago, these were seal inscriptions used to uh, protect uh, a document. So here's again the uh, Kidron Valley looking across to the eastern wall of the Temple Mount, the eastern gate, the Dome of the Rock, the Temple Mount, quite a uh, a wonderful view. It's our first grand view of the of Jerusalem. But in the days of Jesus, this is what Jesus would have seen from the east: the eastern wall, the royal stoa, the southern steps, court of the Gentiles, court of the Israelites, court of the women, court of the priests, the holy chamber of the temple, the Antonia fortress, and the walls of the city. So this is the city that Jesus knew well. In fact, uh, these entrances from the west were used for dignitaries and priests. These have been found, by the way. And the southern steps were used by Jesus and his disciples. The royal stoa consisted of 162 pillars. So what Herod the Great did is that he expanded from what you see in yellow, the size of the first temple, and he doubled the size of the platform by building these retaining walls. And these retaining walls can be still seen today. These retaining walls are made or built with huge stones, some weigh hundreds of tons, like the master course. Question is, how are these stones moved? Some of the smaller ones could be easily moved in place. But for instance, to compare, there's 2.2 million stones of the Great Pyramid in Egypt. The average weight of those are three to four tons. That's all. Uh, some of these stones are hundreds of tons, so they chiseled them away uh, from uh, the temple, and then they rolled them up to four kilometers and set them in place precisely. The Herodian frame was intact, and uh, this is what the temple looked like. An archway that was actually found in 1838. Here's the royal stoa. Here's the temple itself. And uh, here's that picture from 1838. So everything below this archway in blue is all Herodian stone still intact today. And even underneath the archway was a Herodian pavement that we still walk on today. In fact, this is what Jesus would have seen as he looked up to see the arch, probably an entry for dignitaries. And probably there was this southwest corner of the temple that was used for priests to, uh, with the trumpet blast, indicate the beginning and the end of the sabbath could it be that jesus uh, was tempted on this pinnacle and if that's the case notice that this inscription was here uh, and this was found in 1970s on the pavement below it says to the house of trumpeting could it be that if indeed jesus was tempted on that corner i always like to say that jesus probably read that himself so there's the archway you can see above the archway are much later stones, they're small and very insignificant, but below are all Herodian stones, one layer at a time, all the way down to the pavement that Jesus would have used. Notice these stones here are stones that were collapsed by the Romans when the temple was destroyed in 70 AD. Here's the famous Western Wall, which is essentially the retaining wall, the Dome of the Rock again on top. But take a look at this red line, and everything below the red line is pretty much uh, intact Herodian stone, and it goes down another 60 or 70 feet. 
So isn't that amazing that this much of the wall is still left? So and John, I'm going to interrupt you just for a second, just to, this is something else that if you get to see, and, and I don't know if we'll get this opportunity again to go underneath and see some of the stone that uh, that's underneath actually, because there's a way you can get under there, but the stone as it was cut and they were put together, you, you, you can't, I mean, I literally, you can't, you could not take a piece of paper and stick it in between the cracks of where the stones are joined together. It is that tightly fit together, no mortar no mortar, just, just placed together that tightly. That's, it, it was mind boggling. The feat of engineering that occurred with this is incredible. So the temple courts, Jesus is in and out of the temple courts. This is the court of the women here, the 15 Levitical steps where some of the Psalms of Ascent were, were sung, no doubt, Psalm 120 to 134. But uh, the Southern area of the city of Jerusalem, this is no doubt the pool of Siloam. In fact, there was a street that is now intact. It's been found by archaeologists that connect the southwest corner of the temple with the Pool of Siloam. Remember the John 9 story when Jesus places mud on the man's eyes? He says, go and wash in the pool. He probably used this pavement that dates to 30 AD. We think it even was financed by Pontius Pilate. It even had Herodian manholes that allowed rainwater to seep down in through the drainage channel. In fact, we just walked this drainage channel a couple of weeks ago, and you can see the bottom portion of this pavement. That's an amazing thing. This is all Herodian drainage channel, and it would have uh, allowed water to run off into this pool. Now, this is uh, the these are the steps of the Pool of Siloam. And now just recently over the last four months, they've excavated, at least they're trying to find more of the, the steps of the pool. This was probably as big as the pool is, uh, about two Olympic pools put together. But when we return to the Temple Mount, this is the way that Jesus would have entered through this gate and then exited through here. Uh, the royal stow on top. And uh, incidentally, in 1970s, they actually found the original steps of the temple. Uh, Jesus would have used these steps himself. And the royal stoa, every third pillar, was uh, a Roman soldier to keep control of the Jewish activity here, although Gentiles were also allowed uh, on this part of the temple. Now, we'll finish up here with talking about... Uh, the tomb of Jesus and maybe his crucifixion location. So this is the wall of the city 2,000 years ago, and we do know that outside the wall was a deep quarry. In fact, dozens of tombs have been found in the quarry. I've been in essentially all of those tombs as an archaeology student. But as we zoom in here, we're going to suggest that this place was the area of crucifixion of Jesus, and this was the tomb of Jesus one of, again, several dozen tombs as a part of the quarry. The tomb probably looked like this. It had a, a rolling stone, maybe not like this, but it could have been a plug stone as well, but the body would have been placed on the bench. So this guy, pictured here, Hadrian, in fact, this was found at Beit Shan, he dates to 132 AD. He wants to get rid of any evidence of this guy named Jesus, who was apparently crucified in rose again from the tomb that was a part of the quarry. So imagine this. He fills in the quarry with a platform, and he erects a temple to Aphrodite and erects a statue to Venus, one and the same. So he replaces the suggested location for the crucifixion and burial place of Jesus with a pagan temple. 200 years after Hadrian, in the time of Constantine, the Christianized Roman world, uh, the Byzantines use the same platform. They tear down the temple, and instead they build a, a church, and they preserve the area here where the crucifixion took place, and they enclose the tomb with what is called an edicule. This was a tomb, but now they get rid of everything except the bench of the tomb, and they enclose it. Later on, the crusaders would actually rebuild the church, uh, and that's the dome that you still see today. 
but it's remarkable that we maybe we can even we can't be sure but we can even suggest with high confidence this was the place where jesus uh, died for our sins and rose again and uh, again uh, rose uh, victory victoriously over death i should say and that means a great deal of confidence and hope and everlasting life for us those of us who place our faith in him so just a, a great way to end this brief uh, condensed uh, seminar if you will called bringing the bible to life mm -hmm. so i will now stop sharing my screen and go back to uh, the overall view yes. and certainly would be happy to answer any questions that you may have Thank you, John. First of all, very much. Thank you for that. Um, and, and folks, that is just a taste. <laughs> it really is just a taste. Um, there's some phenom There's much more phenomenal information, and it's very possible we may do more semin or, uh, seminars like this, uh, webinars in the future here. Where may we may uh, highlight some other uh, things as well. All right. So we do have a couple questions here. Christine has asked, "What about the garden tomb?" a good question that was a, a protestant alternative site that sort of began in the late 1800s and uh, i love the place there it's an evangelical ministry there they actually uh, present the, the good news of christ uh, to every group i know them well uh, they sell my books there <laughs> but archaeologically uh there's pretty much a zero chance because the tomb that they suggest is a one of a series of old testament tombs and unfortunately uh, the text tells us that uh, jesus was buried in a newly hewn tomb and uh they, so this the tomb that they suggest being the tomb uh cannot possibly be the tomb of jesus just because it dates 700 years prior to his time in fact it's a classic old testament tomb so uh that's my take on it uh, we worship the person, not the place. So uh, that's the way it goes. The Holy Sepulchre Church doesn't feel as if it should be the right place because uh, it's just covered up with what I call religiosity. Uh, oh. A lot of Orthodox, Catholics, Armenians, you name it, Coptics. It's actually the church is uh, controlled by six denominations and they can't get along. In fact, for 800 years, two muslim families own the key to the church <laughs> so so they can't even go in and out on their own because they can't get along so unfortunately uh it doesn't feel like this should be the place of course the holy sepulchre church is inside the uh, old city walls but it was once in the days of jesus outside so archaeologically hands down uh, we suggest that at least the area of the holy sepulchre church preserves the right location and you made a great point there. I saw several people nod their heads and give thumbs up about what you said, that uh, we serve a person, not a place. That's that's exactly right. And on the trips that you take, that's very clear, too, um, that uh, nothing – God is is not any more present with you in Israel than as he is right in this moment because you literally have the Holy Spirit residing inside of you. You have his presence as, as close to you as it have, has ever been in human history. And uh, now, granted, Christ will return to Jerusalem, and so that that's still a significant place, definitely a significant place. But uh, yeah, it's it's a great reminder. Appreciate that, John. You're welcome. Yeah. So far, no other questions yet. Feel free to raise your hand or or put it in the chat. Um, the other thing I was going to mention was you you I. I mentioned it at the last webinar i wanted to bring it up again the <clears throat> the east gate which is mentioned as being the gate where christ will the messiah will will come through in in victory if you will once he returns and uh, i just think it's interesting what and they made sure and, and I, I want you to kind of elaborate on this they made sure to to, to stone that up <laughs> to close it off can you explain uh that a little bit john yeah, uh, Ezekiel 44 tells us the Messiah will come and he'll walk through the eastern gate. Now, the question is, what gate are we talking about? The present gate that's been closed since 810 AD, 
because the Muslims already know what Ezekiel 44 says. So what did they do? They closed it up and to guarantee that the Messiah would not come through it. They even put a, and this is the last couple hundred years, they even put an, an Arab cemetery outside the gate. So a Messiah would not even dare going uh, walk through a cemetery or else he would defile himself, of course. So the question is, uh, was that a, a gate of the temple? Was the gate lower? They found an archway in 1969. It probably wasn't the archway of an, a previous gate, but uh, that whole line of wall does go back to the first temple period. So it's a good question. Will it be a gate uh, part of the third temple? Some believe that a third temple will be built. Others say it won't be necessary. So, you know, it's, you ever watch uh, Fiddle on the Roof? You know, Tevi says, well, on the one <laughs> hand, on the other hand, well, that's sort of how we... Uh, view things uh, on the one hand if you hold to this view well then that's certainly the gate that jesus is going to use but uh maybe not maybe it'll be another gate maybe it'll be a gate of the new temple but again that yeah. depends on i guess one's theological and eschatological position yeah but and that that's yeah. interesting too that they would assume that he would not defile himself by coming through a seminary a cemetery seminary yeah. <laughs> sorry common misconception right. um okay. no but <laughs> it uh jesus defiled himself in all sorts of ways when he was here he <laughs> touching dead bodies right uh and and all sorts of different things that he would do i it's funny because i they would assume that i would not assume that if you really know the life of christ um i don't know that's a good yeah. question, though. But it's interesting. It's it's actually it's a hollow gate. It's it's closed, and the Muslims have been using it, sort of against the peace treaty uh, ar ar arrangement with the Israelis. Uh, they use it as a mosque. It's a, a small area there, but uh, it's unfortunate that it's not being used uh, in the right way by Muslims who are they have a presence on the Temple Mount today. But that's a political issue in itself so we won't get into that <laughs> so, good yeah question. and yeah yeah and several people by the way uh patrick saying thank you this is wonderful benjamin thanks bro john uh you're welcome. You're thank you for all the great information says iphone <laughs> so before i have to go and maybe you'll bring this to a close mike let me just say sure. that if you are interested interested in any of our resources my books, a topography map, a drone video, uh, that kind of stuff. Just hop on our website. Uh, back, I'll just type it in, biblicalisraeltours.com. Some of you already know this because you found this session tonight through our website. Uh, but you can also uh, phone me or text me at that number. If you have any other questions at all, I'll be happy to uh, take a call or a text or correspond with an email. Yeah. Appreciate it, John. That's great. You're welcome. And again, um, so in partnership with my organization, Empowered Manhood, um, uh, we are actually doing a trip to Israel next September, 2024, September 3rd through the 14th. So we'd love for you to join us on, on that trip as well. Um, it's going to be an incredible experience for sure. Some of you I know have already, I've talked to you beforehand, you were um, looking to to take a trip already and maybe even had plans uh, already to join one of his trips in 2024. Nina Donahoe asks, is it possible to get a recording of this Zoom or copy of slides? Definitely of the Zoom, yes, we can make that uh, accessible to you for sure. Um, I'll share the, there's usually with the video, I don't know if I'll, I'll probably extract it and have it housed in in YouTube, and then I'll share the link with with uh, through Dan, uh, John. Yeah, and then uh, Winnie says thanks, John. We look forward to touring Israel with you next May. So there's somebody who's got a yeah good a trip planned with you. Yeah, definitely. You are not going to be disappointed, that's for sure. So good. All right. John, thank you so much, brother. This You're was welcome. fantastic. Really appreciate it. And uh, and folks, we'll let you know when we have other uh, uh, experiences like this, other webinars like this, if you'd like to to jump on another one. And we'll make this one, of course, available to you. So let me go ahead and pray for us to close our time together. Heavenly Father, God, thank you so much that we we can know that the Bible is rooted in real, tangible 
history. God, thank you so much for being a God who interacts with reality, with 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 time and space with us, Lord, that you 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 entered into our world and put flesh on. Um, Father, it's so good to know how faithful you are to us in revealing yourself to us, Lord. And even today, as we excavate and archaeologists search for new clues, Lord, you you continue to reveal yourself to us, Father. Thank you for the opportunity you've given us to go on trips to Israel. Thank you for people like John who have devoted their lives to this experience for us, God. We praise you for all the training that he's been through, the ways you've equipped him to lead these trips, and for the the seminar we've experienced tonight, Lord. We praise you for that, God, and thank you for bringing us ever closer to you. Uh, We praise you, Lord, for your goodness and your faithfulness now. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Thank you, John. You're Thank welcome. you, everybody, for joining us.